Good morning, good job to everybody. Good job to everybody. Good job to everybody. I, I recognize some of the some of the faces here, right? That we learned a little bit together last year in uh, Beis Shifka, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so we can pick up where we left off. And I think we used to we used to start back then with um, if any questions or comments or thoughts that you had, right? That's what we used to do. Yeah? Right? So, I guess we can just start with that. Any ideas or questions, comments that we want to discuss before we get into what we, whatever we prepared? No? Nothing? Okay. Sorry? I asked if there's any questions or comments or thoughts that you wanted to start with before I shared with you what I prepared. No? Okay. So, we'll start and then uh, the floor is always open. Yeah, I, I don't want to speak, I don't know how long this thing is, but I don't want to talk for an hour, so please. Interrupt me with your questions, with your thoughts, your comments, counter-arguments, something. Yeah? Deal? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to share with you tonight, uh, this morning, um, I'm hoping is not entirely new information. Right? It's taken from Tanya, and I know that you guys have been learning that, so I'm hoping we remember and understand some of these ideas that we're going to share. <clears throat> but the Friedrich Eber writes that uh, every now and again, a chassid should think to himself, what would I look like if I didn't learn Tanya? And what do I look like now that I did learn Tanya? And it's a very important exercise to be able to articulate for yourself, excuse me, what it is that Tanya gave to you, what it is that chassidus gave to you, assuming and hoping that it did. And, and I, I imagine, I imagine uh, some of you might connect to what I'm saying, oh, you see, this is a big part of my life, and it would be nice to go through this exercise of trying to articulate why this is unique and, and, and what it did for me in my life. And I'm sure some of you are thinking to myself, thinking to yourselves, yeah, I, I've been to a lot of Hasidus classes, but it's completely, fully meaningless to me, personally. I'm sure many of you think that way as well. I don't know, maybe, being presumptuous, but it happens, right? So I, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna uh, put it to you that I, with most of you without even realizing it, or some realize more or less, there's a lot of things that you intuitively know and uh, a certain lens that you way view, the way in which you view a lot of the world, and without even knowing it, it's because you like soaked in chassidus from the walls of your house and your school. I'm telling you this is as, as a fact. And, and with Hashem's help, as you go through life, and you'll meet new people and you'll meet new ideas and encounter new things. Sometimes you might feel uh, <clears throat> intrigued by these ideas and things. And there's going to come a point, and this is really the point of maturity, where you say, well, oh, that's what they were talking about. Okay, this is a different way of thinking about it. And then the light's going to go off in your head where you're going to see that a lot of the things you learned actually shape a lot of what you think and a lot of what you see without even realizing it. The word in English is by osmosis. It means just by the existence of the air that's around you, you see things in a different light. But again, back to the main point, it's important to articulate these things for ourselves so we can like really pinpoint and say, here's something <clears throat> that I know that I can say in a sentence or two or three to explain how Chassidah shaped the way I think about X. Right? You, I'm, I'm sure you know the letter that's printed in the beginning of Hayyam Yom. I imagine you learned it this morning, or we'll learn it sometime today, right? The letter from the Rebbe Hashab, where he describes Yitzhak Kitzvah as the Rosh Hashanah for Chassidus. And um, there he says, Or v'chayis nafshenu nitan lanu. The light and life of our souls were given to us. Who's the us? Huh? Who's the us? What? Not me and you? Who are they? Me and you, right? We are the us. You, me, right? So do we feel like light and life was given to us today? And if we don't, we're missing something. We are the us. It's not something out there. It's, we are the us. So if it describes light and life being given to us, then that's us. We have to know what that is. <clears throat> and I'm saying this because that Deborah points this out. The language of light and life. Use, let's be, highlight the, the, the usage of the word light. If we turned all the lights off in this room, 
their room would be exactly the same. It'd be the same people, the same table, the same cup of water, and the same pink walls. If the lights were completely off, the exact same wall, exact same room. What changes when you turn on the light is on the one hand, nothing. It's the same room, but everything changes because now you can actually experience and appreciate and enjoy the room. And the same thing is true of life in some respects. You can have a body that technically exists in all of its, let's just say someone who's sleeping. Everything about the person is present, but it's lacking a life. The person's not conscious. The person's not talking, walking, thinking. It's there technically, but it's not alive. And that's what Chassidus does. So it's not a new Yiddish guide, God forbid. It's the same Torah mitzvah since the beginning of time, since Sinai. But with Chassidus, the light's turned on. Now there's a new life. There's a new light, there's a new enthusiasm in Torah mitzvahs. So today I'm going to zero in on one particular idea, a very sensual idea, and I'm sure you've heard the words many times, and uh, try to articulate what's the light that Chassidus illuminates and turns on in this regard. And that specific idea is <clears throat> what we know as Hashkacha Pratis. Did we ever talk about that in, in Hebeshevka? We, we had a class on that with Rabbi Wendell. Okay. Explain what it was like before the Bosch. Okay. So I hope no one was listening so well, so that way my class will be interesting. I'm kidding. <clears throat> okay, so you've heard the words Hashkacha Pratis. Do we know the translation of the words, the two words? Which word's divine, which one's providence? <laughs> You're right, but it's not the translation, right? <laughs> You're right, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the direct translation of the words hashkacha pratis has two words. Neither of them are divine, nor is either any of them providence, right? Whatever providence means, even. Uh, what does hashkacha pratis mean? Anybody? Translation. What does hashkacha mean? Watching. Oh, thank you. Hashkacha means supervision, like you have hashkacha on the, not on the water bottle, maybe it also does, I don't know. Yeah, it does. Supervision, right, there's hashkacha because someone supervised it to make sure that it's kosher. I'm not sure how much supervision water needs to be kosher, but the supervision to make sure it's kosher. That's hashkacha. And pratis means specific or detailed. So the Vashem Tov introduced novelty. Hashem supervises every individual item. Okay? Every individual item means literally every individual item. So before we get to what, what's, be, what's really the Basham Tov saying in this, just a technical translation and, and, and idea that the Basham Tov is putting forth. Individualized supervision or specific supervision means every specific creation that exists is being supervised by the Creator. Right? You all know the story with the leaf and there's the worm, the song of Ramfried's Yiddish song, right? We all know that. Yes? Right? The leaf falls off the thing and it's blowing this way and that way because that's how Hashem wants it to be. So it's specific, individualized supervision for everything that exists. Okay, and what did they think before? This is the Basham Tov's innovation. The Basham Tov is only 300 years ago, a little bit more. So what did they think before since the giving of the Torah? There were no Jewish philosophers who thought about how Hashem supervises the world. It's only about for people. So Hashem this individualized supervision is for humans. Hashem supervises individual humans and the individual activities surrounding humans. And for everything else in the world, Hashem supervises in such a manner that it's called? It's Sorry? Klalis, which is the opposite of Pratis. Pratis being specific and Klalis being general. Or in the words of the Rambam, Minis, which means species. He uses Hashkacha Ishis, like individual person supervision. That would be for humans. And for everything else, he says, Hashkacha minis, on the species, which means Hashem couldn't care, to put it in blunt language, if a worm lives or dies. Just to make sure that the species of the worms he keeps on going to keep the ecosystem running. <coughs> right? So Hashem doesn't care if this cow lives or dies, or if it moves this way or moves that way. What's the difference? And if it eats this blade of grass or that blade of grass, who cares? Just make sure cows exist overall so that the species keeps on going. And that's it. No reason to be busy ourselves in anything more. Unless the cow belongs to a person, then Hashem has to decide, is it going to live or die? Because that's going to change the person's parnasa. But that's already related to the human. In fact, the Ramam goes on to say that it's foolish to think God busies himself with individual cows. What are you reducing Hashem to foolishness like whether a cow lives or dies? He refers to it as foolish, silly. So then how could the Baal Shem do? Yeah, right? Say 
doctor. Exactly. Where did you get that from? Where did you get that from? Fantastic question. We really wish to get this idea that individual, that Hashem cares for individual cows. Then Rabbi Shah points to one Gemara where the Gemara says, at least according to one version of Rashi, that Hashem cares about whether a certain fish lives or dies. So, he, 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 sorry, you remember that? Rabbi Wanger pointed that to Gemara. Yeah, so that's a Gemara, but that doesn't help us understand. So now the Gemara said it, now it makes more sense to us? Not really. Not really, exactly. Okay, so the Gemara is there. Rambam would say it too. <clears throat> exactly. Well, there's two versions in Rashi. Rambam could take the other version. Rambam doesn't have to agree with Rashi at all. <laughs> right? But in terms of if you're looking for a source in classic sources, it's there. In that, in that particular Gemara. In that particular version of Rashi. So what, 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 why did Basham to change that? And what's the point? And it's really a good question. Why would God care about individual worms? Why? Who cares? Or individual blades of grass? And like we just said from the Rambam, it's, the Rambam says it's foolish to think that God's busying himself with blades of grass. Who cares? Right? In fact, if we think about it deeper, not only should God not care about blades of grass, he shouldn't care about humans either. Why are we so arrogant to think that we're more important than blades of grass? Relative to grass, we're more important, not because we're more important objectively, but because we're stronger than grass and we walk on grass. <laughs> and we have to be able to rip grass up. It doesn't make us, objectively speaking, any more valuable. Certainly not if you're coming from the perspective of the infinite God. Sorry? We have mission to do in grass now. So now you're introducing a Hasidic idea. Grass is mission. But you just introduced mission. Has a mission. That's a Hasidic idea. You're skipping. You're cheating. See, I'm, I'm, but I'm proving to you that you already have glasses from Hasidus. Because you know where they end already. But you're right. But I'm going backwards before Hasidus to make this point. But what is that purpose before Hasidus? No, you're right. Certainly it's purpose. What is it? Hashem couldn't care. He can't care. He's infinite. To think that Hashem cares is foolish. He's infinite. God's busying himself with the pettiness of humans. Please. I mean, the reason why the world was created to begin with is for the humans. But for what? Well, for, 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 exactly. No, but but if you're pre-Chassidus, if you're... In Midrashim, it's in Torah, everywhere. Hashem created the world to choose. Hashem yeah. The world, like, you know, the... <laughs> what? Hashem created the first Torah and then he created the people. Right, right, right. So you, you, these are all Midrash, they all exist, but they're all very Hasidic ideas. So I'm just demonstrating to you how you guys already have Hasidic glasses, which is good, but we're articulating the point. Before Hasidus, God doesn't care about humans. He can't. He's too big. But he's being, he's being nice and doing us a favor by giving us a Torah so we can get better, so we can grow, we can live more meaningful lives, and we can have a share in the world to come. And therefore, the only reason for, to, for him to supervise anything in our world is just to that end, to make sure that human, or to follow all the humans along and see, are they following Torah? And if they're not, punish them. If they are, reward them. And if the only reason why Hashem is supervising the universe is for the sake of reward and punishment, there is no reason to follow, hum to follow worms. But there's a reason to follow humans. In fact, not all humans even. What about non-Jews? Non Good question. I think it's a shame, I think it's a shame, Ramun, who goes through 10 levels of Ashkacha. Ten levels of Hashem's supervision, increasing as you get closer and closer to fulfilling Torah. Now you're more worthy of Hashem's time to watch you. Right? Rambam writes, in fact, that the punishment, quote unquote, for the wicked is because you stop to care about God, so God stops caring about you. Now you're left to nature like a worm. And either you, either you survive or you don't. Just like a worm might survive or not. So you lose Ashkacha. That's what he writes. You get, you get, you get subject to... Mikra Nikra, you get subject to the happenstance of nature, and that's it. That, that's what Rambam writes. How can we, like, say, like, oh, that's wrong? Like, the Rebbe reconciles the two. There's a famous sikha in, in which the Rebbe reconciles the two opinions, the pre and the post Hasidic model. It's a difficult sikha, I'm not sure I have fully understand it completely, but the Rebbe does reconcile the two, and how it's possible that they coexist. So along comes Chassidus, comes the Bashantav, and says, no, there's Ashkacha Pratis, there's individualized supervision for every single item in creation. And Hashem is, in, is following the worm. So there's two, things, there's two questions we have to answer. There's two challenges that the pre-Chassidic model challenges Chassidus without knowing Chassidus exists yet, but challenges Chassidus. One is, what kind of silly idea is this that God is busy with worms? Why would he care? 
To, for what, to what end? And the second question is, is God not infinite? How is it possible for Hashem to care about anything at all? Unless He's doing us a favor. And what's He doing? Worms favors? And following them too? These are very challenging questions. And in many ways, the first two chapters of Shari Yechid Vamuna, you learn Shari Yechid Vamuna? Yes? Part two of Tanya, in which the al Rebbe rationalizes his way. Did we learn it? Yeah, we understand it? Part uh, No? Okay, so I'm going to say it briefly. What the al Rebbe does in chapter two of Shari Yechid Vamuna, it's actually mind-blowing. If you think about it, you can think about it a thousand times. It's absolutely mind-blowing. The al Rebbe logically concludes by observance of our world that Hashem must be involved in every particular part of our world. That's the whole point of what he's trying to say there in the first two chapters. That's what he's trying to do. And the way he explains this is, just very briefly, because it's, it's, it's off topic a little bit, not completely, but a little bit off topic, and it requires obviously much more, but just very briefly. Things remain in existence if the conditions for their existence are present. Follow that? So a black hole, you've heard of a black hole? Yeah? So a black hole lacks the conditions for our existence. It doesn't have space, which is the most primary condition for our existence. And therefore everything reverts, just can't exist there. It sucks up the space and everything in it. Right? That's the point of a, that's, that's, it's a negative energy because it doesn't, it lacks the very conditions we need to exist as we are. Right? So things require the condition for their existence in order to be. Right? The conditions for this cup yeah, is plastic. Plastic existed before the machine made this cup. And because the conditions for this cup existed before the cup was made, therefore, when the machine makes the cup, the cup stands on its own. Following? Because the conditions already existed. There's a joke, but it makes a good point. The joke goes that scientists come to God and say, God, we figured out how to make man from earth. So God says, oh, fantastic, let's see. Thank you heard the story? You guys didn't hear it from me? You did hear it. Thank you for remembering. No? So the story is that the, so the, the scientists invite God into the lab and they show God this elaborate machine and apparently on one side you're gonna put earth and a human's gonna come out on the other end. So they're about to pour the earth into the machine and God says, hey, 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 go get your own earth. <laughs> right? The point being that anything we create is to take things that exist and reshape them into some new existence, which means before we touch anything, the conditions for that existence already exists. So before anybody thought of making this plastic cup, all the ex necessary components of this plastic cup to exist already existed. And the plastic that they took to make this cup could have been anything else. Could have been a bottle, could have been a plate, it could have been a fork, could have been anything. And we just extracted one iteration of what the plastic could have been, a cup. And thus, nothing we create requires our continuous investment. But when you do something that is contrary to the conditions of that thing, you have to continuously be investing to keep it going. So this is the example that Altera gives. You take this cup of water, and if I take a straw and blow into the cup of water, and I make an indent in the water, the conditions of that indent do not exist before my blowing into it, because water, by nature, flows. So if I want that hole to be in the water, I have to constantly be forcing it in there. So whenever you have something whose conditions for its existence don't exist, you have to have an external force to keep it in existence. Following? That's a theoretical truth, not an actual truth. It's a theory, actually, everybody discusses that. And a famous Sikhla never says this, it was shocking to those who listened. But it's true in a theoretical sense, not in a reality sense. What I mean is, is that the observable reality as we see it doesn't follow that. Hashem could have done otherwise, because look around. Nothing exists unless you, not, nothing without the conditions for their existence exists unless I'm making it exist. But so, it could totally be that only from a theoretical perspective, because God can do whatever he wants. But not yeah. because of, not, not from a realistic perspective. So how do we know that God is doing it that way and not a different way? Maybe, but the, then the conditions of our reality would be different. In other words, the conditions of our reality is that we cannot have this crater stay unless I blow it. Indicating that the conditions of reality are that you have to have external force to keep it going. Otherwise, the conditions of our reality would be different. 
the, in other words, the very nature of our existence, sorry? How do you know? It's deductive reasoning. The, By obs- but, every observable thing follows the same pattern, right? But, Which means that's the inherent condition of our reality. deductive reasoning, you could come up with anything. I mean, like... Okay, go for it. <laughs> no, I'm certain, no, I'm being a little facetious. But you're right. In other words, you could logic your way to everything. But by observable, that's, 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 what all, that's how all science works. So it kind right? of sounds as though they made it up. Sorry? It sounds well, that's interesting. So he up. starts off in Pedic Aleph, quoting a Pusik and a Medrash. And then only in Pedic Bays does he get to the logical reasoning. Almost as if, look, there's a Pusik that backs it up, that Tereda says it's right. Now here I'm going to explain it to you so you understand it. What? That's, 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 that's what it seems to me the pattern is. Because he could have started with Pedic Bays. Wait, you know the Prakim? No? So the first paddock and the, the first paddock he says the fact that Hashem's energy is invested in creation to keep it going, and he quotes the Pasuk and quotes a Medrash to prove it. And then in Pedic Bays he gives that logical reasoning. So But you could like you could take any Pasuk from the Torah and then somehow like I don't know, like it could And you could become an author. It could be anything. You then be, and become an author of Torah. Go for it. That's what the library is full of. Of people who did just that. Alert the psukim, try to understand it the best they can and explain it as best they can. Right? So this is the Alter Rebbe's rationale. Yeah? That if, if the conditions for our reality did not exist par- prior to our reality, that's what nothing is. The absence of anything. No thing. So there is no conditions under which reality makes sense prior to our reality and therefore it requires a constant external force to be. That's the la- rationale. Follow? This is a review. I'm, I'm assuming you learned this, these prakim, yes? Completely flying over everybody's head? I mean, we didn't learn it inside, but we learned the This concept, yeah? yeah? Okay, so that was the main... This, the, main the reason why the Altair did this whole exercise is to make this point. If the blade of grass exists, that means there's an external force, the creative force, that keeps that blade of grass going. And therefore, there must be continuous supervision of that grass. The supervision not being something outside of the blade of grass, but the very energy that's keeping the blade of grass in existence. That's the supervision. Which is already, another sh- already a shift. The model of supervision that the Rambam described is a creation. Hashem is an infinite creator beyond everything. And he's doing us a favor by supervising something down here. And the Alter says you're, you're missing the point of supervision. It's not an external, for, external God out there looking at what's happening way down below. It's the creative force that exists in this thing in order for it to be, that's the supervision. And my proof that it's there is because it's here, because the cup is here. And if the cup is here, that means there's divine creation, make, divine creative force making that cup be, and thus it's being supervised by that divine force. Following? Yeah? Okay, so we answered the first question, or at least partially. How is it that God's busy with little worms? Well, he decided to be. And if the worms are here, it means he's making them. He's creating them currently. Right. Now, as for the fact that God is too big to be busy with worms, the Altarba doesn't address that in Tanya, at least not directly. He mentions it briefly uh, in one line, but elsewhere in the Kutera, the Altarba explains this. Kutera explains this. And the basic idea is that, listen carefully to this. God is not infinite. He said, infinite is a description. It's a label. Sorry? Uh, we just learned this. Uh, you did? Yeah, so Fantastic, so yeah. <laughs> Hashem is beyond infinite. And he chose to manifest infinite. And he also chose to manifest finite. So let's just give a little more words to that. Since these are very fancy th- words. The basic things. The, when you say something... Uh, How can we say God is infinite? Because infinite is saying a That's right. That's right. It's mind-blowing, right? It should make your head... It should make your head... Okay, so if you like that little mental exercises, think of this, okay? And, and this doesn't address it directly, but uh, it, it indirectly does. So the space between my two fingers right here, right? You can divide that space infinitely. Cut it in half, then cut that in half, and cut that in half, cut that in half, zoom in, cut in half, cut in half, cut in half. You can go on to infinity in this space. What about in this space, which is a foot bigger? You can also cut it... So is this infinite bigger than this infinite? No. How's that possible? <laughs> what? Infinite is infinite. Here's the key. Infinity is bigger than other infinities. That's like a mathematical 
that's the, this is what I'm talking about. There's a mathematical thing about the infinite between the between my fingers here versus the infinite between my hands here. Right, this one is bigger. Yep, but that's kind of an insane concept. How is infinite bigger than infinite? So, so this actually addresses this this indirectly. If you guys like this stuff, there's a lot to read on this. So, just briefly, the infinite we experience in our universe is not actual infinite. It's what's called infinite in potentia. Infinite in potential. Because at what point, when you cut the space in half between my fingers, at what point did you say, boom, I got to the infinite time? Never. never. That's the whole point. So you never actually are in infinite. It's only infinite in potential, in that I can keep on going. So say numbers. Numbers are infinite, right? So at what point did you hit number infinite? Never. The point is, whatever number you have, you can always do plus one. Correct? So it's not actual infinite. It's only infinite in potential. And that's why you can have one infinite than the other, bigger than the other, because it's in potential. Right? But that is still finite. It's just finite that haven't reached its finitude yet. So, are you following? It, it's truly, it's really, it's finite. It's actually what, what Kabbalah calls Ein Sarif, no end. Because it has no en hasn't ended yet. But there's another level which Kabbalah refers to as Ein Trila. Has no beginning. Not has no end. Follow it, following? Because it's really infinite. Not infinite that it doesn't stop. But it's truly infinite. Follow that? Sorry? No? I, so use the numbers thing, right? Numbers can go on forever, right? So it's infinite. But do you ever hit number infinite? No, I got that. Right, following. Yeah. So which means if you want to describe Hashem's infinite, you can't describe it in no end. Because that would mean wherever I go, I can go a little bit farther. And then I can go a little bit farther. But when do I hit the actual infinite? Never. Never. So it's not actual infinite, it's only infinite that doesn't stop. Isn't that the finite hasn't stopped yet? Or the finite will never stop because the numbers keep on going. It's not a number, it's an idea. Precisely. It's fitting for something you can't put into something. Precisely right. An idea. Would precisely. Be a description. Pre precisely right. Well, ideas are not limited by, by spatial limits, but they're limited by conceptual limits, right? Like music doesn't get weighed on a scale, right? Because they're different, conceptually different things, right? Yeah. yeah? So, in that sense, there is a relative infinite. What limits are you breaking? But if you can get to real infinite, then the only thing you can say is what it's not. That's what Ein Tchila means. We have no words to begin to say what it is, because it's truly infinite. Right? Following? Following? Hope your mind is being blown, because this is really cool stuff. Yeah? Unless you've heard it before, then... Sorry? No, it just created a thing of anything about Yeah. Good. Right. It's like, even like... It should blow your mind, yeah. It's the idea. It really, really should. To think about it, it's crazy, right? But that's not truly what Hashem is at the end. Because it's not a, even though it's not a description, it's a negative description. I'm describing what it's not. So I've limited it to not being the things I say it's not. It's not finite. And that's the point you were saying. Saying Hashem is infinite is itself to give it a label and limit it to, to be not being finite. So the essence of Hashem, what we call Atmos, because we have no word. There's a famous sikhah that ever said that the word atmos also isn't correct. We just have no other words to say atmos, so we say atmos. Atmos means just means essence. It just is. To use the language of Rambam, actually, the only thing you can say is that it doesn't not exist. So this exists. Infinite is beyond existence. And then Hashem doesn't not exist. It's like a double negative. Finite is a positive description. Infinite is a negative description. It's not infinite. And then Hashem is not not exist. <laughs> Got it? You can't say it exists because now you give it a label. Mm -hmm. You can't say it doesn't exist because now you're saying it's out of... Now you're saying it doesn't, it's not there. So what do I say about it? It doesn't not exist. All I can say about it is a double negative. I have no real words to say anything about it. And because it's absolutely not limited by absolutely anything, including infinite, it can decide to care about worms. Because why not? And by the fact that the worms are here, it means he did care about it. And decided to mass manifest energy to create that worm. It's mind-blowing stuff. Yes, with me? Anybody with me? Okay, it's going to get a little less philosophical as we go forward. So now for the next question. What's the point? Okay, so we proved that Hashem is invested in every particular small thing. There must be particular supervision. And the supervision is not something outside looking at something here, but rather it's the creative force that's in that thing. To what end? 
And this gets point, who mentioned mission? Who said mission? There's the Hasidic glasses. The pre-Hasidic model is, right? Hashem is infinite, there's truth to that, and he's watching what's going on here, because he's doing us a favor to see how we're behaving, to reward and punish. But if the supervision is not from outside, but because he's creating it, then the supervision is based on, well, why am I creating it? For what purpose? For what purpose? So the supervision is now not simply to see whether God should reward or punish anything, in which case, who cares about the worms? But Hashem is creating, is watching everything to see, is that item in this particular place at the right time to fulfill its purpose? And everything has a purpose. It's only a degree of purpose. And as you climb a totem pole of existence, you get more central and central to the purpose. So it's correct to say that there's more individualized supervision for humans than there are for worms, because the humans are more central to the purpose. But by extension of that same purpose, there's a purpose to the worm too, and less supervision for the worm. And this is the big, big shift between the pre and the post Hasidist model. Not simply whether Hashem is watching the worms or not. That's not the main shift. The main shift is, what's the reason why Hashem is watching? To reward or punish, or for purpose? That is the big shift. Clear? Everything else said till now is just the philosophical background to prove and explain to ourselves why that's the case. But the main point is to come to this realization that the reason why Hashem is watching everything in the world, including you, is because of the purpose and mission that that particular item and you as an individual have. So three practical things that change when you think of it this way. Make sure they didn't miss anything. Yeah. The first is, so three practical shifts that happen when you think of Hashem is watching us, not as... Uh, reward and punishment, but for purpose. Difference number one is, when something happens to you, what's my reaction? So if, sorry? It has to happen. Like, so, good. Yeah, like, so if the reason is... For, first, first mind is why it's happening to me. Like, yeah, exactly. So if the reason why something happens is for reward and punishment, then the, when something happens to me, I ask myself, is God rewarding me or punishing me? I missed my plane. Is it because the plane's going to crash? That's the pre chasidist model. Where the supervision is to reward and punish. So I have to ask myself, why is this happening to me? Is it a reward? Or is it a punishment? Is there something I'm doing wrong that God's telling me to fix? Because he's punishing me. That's the pre chasidist model. And the pro chasidist model says, well, if something happened to me, then the question is, what's my purpose here? Complete and total mind shift. Something happens in my life, positive or negative, I say, Hashem is creating this circumstance right here, right now, because it fulfills a purpose. For who? For what? For me. What's my purpose now? Not why is it happening to me and what's, is God rewarding me or punishing me? But he's setting me up for a mission. What's the mission? Following? It's a mind-blowing shift. I'll tell you a story that, I, I don't know if I guys told, told you the story last time. Running out of time, but it's a story that says like, that goes like this. Uh, there's once a fellow, if I told you the story, tell me. There's once a fellow who decided he wants to see Eliyahu Anavi. Did I tell you the story? It's one of my favorite stories. Sorry? Yeah, so he's fasting 40, sorry? I'll say it again. Yeah, this guy wants to meet Eliyahu Anavi. So he opens up all the fancy books to talk about how to meet Eliyahu Anavi and does everything it says there. He's fasting, he's learning, he's doing all kinds of fancy things. And of course, nothing happens. He goes to his Rebbe, don't know which one it is. Goes to his Rebbe and says, Rebbe, I did everything that every book prescribed and I still haven't seen Eliyahu Navi. What gives? And the Rebbe tells him, that's very strange. Um, okay, you know what? I have, I have some advice for you. Circus is coming up. Fill up a box of food and clothing. Go to the edge of town. Here's the address. And I told you a story. story. It's the best story ever. And about a half an hour before Yom Tif, knock on the door and ask if you could spend Yom Tif with them. So he does. Fills up the box with food, with clothing, knocks on the door of Yom Tif and says, hi, can I spend Yom Tif with you? A rundown shack, a little family, uh, not very, uh, what's the word, glamorous. And uh, this 
hostess looks at this person and like, you want to spend yomtev with us? I mean, no problem, but I don't really have anything for you. I don't have any food, nothing. The guy says, no worries, I have a box of food here. He says, sure, come in, spend yomtev with us. So he's there for yomtev and he's expecting in the middle of the night to be woken up and Eliyahu is going to come to him or something. He's davening, he's fat, I don't know, whatever he's doing. And of course, nothing happens. He goes back to his Rebbe and says, I did what you said, where's Eliyahu Navi? And his Rebbe says, that's very strange. You sure Eliyahu Navi didn't come? You must have missed him. He says, no, nope, nothing happened. I'm sorry, try it again. Next week is Simchat Torah. Go for Simchat Torah half an hour before Yom Tov. Knock on the door. Ask if he's spent Yom Tov with them. Fine. Rebbe said he's listening. He fills a box of food, goes back to the door, and he's about to knock on the door, and he feels like a fool. What am I harassing this poor family for, making spending Yom Tov with them? This, this is ridiculous. And he says, you know what? Forget Eliyahu Navi. Okay, whatever. My life will be fine without it. I'm going home. And he's about to leave. He can hear from the inside uh, mother-child conversation. Child turns to the mother and says, Mommy, we have no food for Yom Tov. What are we doing? Yom Tov's in a half an hour. We have nothing. And the mother says, Do you remember last week we said the same thing and Eliyahu never showed up? Don't worry, Yasha, Eliyahu never will be back. And he got the message. The point that he's ever trying to teach him is, you're looking for Eliyahu never to come to you. Maybe you're supposed to be Eliyahu never for someone else. This is the shift to pre-post Hasidus model. Something happened to me. Is it for me? My reward, my punishment? Maybe there's a mission I have to fulfill. And this comes from Ashkach Pratis. Even though the word, the word Ashkach Pratis is talking about worms, the main message is not for worms. The main message is for me and you. To shift the way we think about the things and the circumstances of our lives. Not as it's happening to me, but happening for me to fulfill my purpose. Practical shift number one. Number two. When we say that Hashem is with you. Hashem is with you. What does that mean? So in the pre chassidist model, what does it mean Hashem is with you? It means if you're a worthy subject because you're taking advantage of this great gift called Torah to improve your life, then Hashem will take the time out of his day, so to speak, and watch how you're doing. But if you mess up, you're a little less worthy of Hashem's supervision. And Hashem being with you, even for the guy who's doing right, is that Hashem is up here, metaphorically speaking, conceptually speaking, farther away, watching me, because I'm worthy of Him watching me. But when you understand Hashem Pratis, and you understand that if this thing exists, it's because Hashem is willing it to existence and emanating of His energy into this thing here and now. So what does it mean Hashem is, in every, Hashem is with me? Literally in me, literally with me in my circumstance, not somewhere out there following me because he's being nice. But he's invested in my circumstance here and now as it is. To give better language for this. And this is really what Dalton was trying to talk about in this whole busy, but Simpson, Kipshita, Laf Kipshita, you learned this, this business? Is Simpson literal? Is Simpson not literal? No? Okay, so you didn't get to Perek Zion yet. Are you learning Shreich Lamuna here? Yes. What part are you holding? Sorry? Just a bit of, oh, okay, so you'll see this in, in Perek Zion. Without the talks about whether the Tzimtzum is Kipshutte or not Kipshutte, without getting into all the uh, nuances of what that is, I'll just give you this language. When you get to chapter 7, apply the language I'm giving you now, you'll see it, it will help you articulate it. Hashem is everywhere. You heard that statement, right? We sing it as two-year-olds. Hashem is here, Hashem is there. We, we all sing it, right? But now it's time to mature and understand what that means. Yeah? So what does that mean, Hashem is everywhere? One plus one equals two is also everywhere. It is everywhere. It's a concept, and isn't it everywhere? Where in the world does one plus two equals two not exist? It exists everywhere. But if this table is here or not, does it make a difference to one plus one equals two? Completely irrelevant. So the fact that one plus one equals two is everywhere is irrelevant to the circumstances of existence. Right? That's the, that, that's the way the pre chassidist model of what it means Hashem is everywhere. Hashem is infinite. He can't care about worms. Of course He's everywhere because He's not not everywhere. But is he invested in the particular circumstance of the particular worm? Nah, if the worm was here, not here, would be the same Hashem. And it's true. Ani Hashem Leishanisi, God doesn't change. And yet, Hashem is invested in the particular worm in its particular circumstance. Not like one plus one equals two, where Hashem is just everywhere happens to be. Because he's beyond the limits of creation. But he's invested in the limits of creation. That's the whole point of Ashkach Pratis. That is invested within every particular creation to make it exist now. So if I'm, ex if I'm living in a circumstance and, I, and whatever the circumstance is, this idea that Hashem was with me is quite literal. 
Not because he's everywhere and he's doing me a favor by paying attention to me. But because he's literally invested in my reality as I perceive it. Making it be that way. So the comfort in knowing Hashem is with me is so much deeper. And so much more real when we understand the Hashem Pratis. Okay. Do you want to say it? Go, go for it. Can I do it? Okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you this. When you say Hashem knows you, Hashem knows your thoughts, what's the reaction? Hmm? It gets scary, it's embarrassing. Hashem knows my thoughts. It's embarrassing. Right? But that's not, that's only a surface level of, your know, of knowing you. In the same way Hashem knows all your embarrassing thoughts, he knows how deeply embarrassed you are of them also. He knows how you're struggling with them. So his knowledge of you is not like something outside looking at you and saying, oh my gosh, what's with that person? But it's inside of your circumstance. So the things you're struggling with, it's in there also. The knowledge Hashem has, which is linked to Hashem's supervision, is inside of that too. On a very, uh, you guys all living in the dormitory or living at home? Some, some. So those who are living in the dormitory will appreciate this. So you meet your roommate the first day and seems like a nice person. One week later, the person's annoying as anything. Can't stand this person. Yeah. And a month later, you really get to know the person and you start to realize, oh, wow, now I get where this person's coming from. You start to empathize a little bit more. Right? And we know that experience? Because that's what happens. You know people and they put on an exterior. Oh, very nice. You dig a little deeper, you start to know their thoughts. I'm like, oh my gosh, this person's really weird. And then you dig a little deeper and you get to know the person's real thoughts. And go, okay, the reason why they think this way is because of that and because of this and they're struggling with that and working with that. And now you truly empathize because you got inside the person's thinking. That's Hashem's knowledge of you. That's Hashem being with you on an even deeper level. Not outside looking at you and saying, mm, ah, bad thought, punishment. Good thought, yay, reward. That's the pre-Chasidus model. The post chassidus model is Hashem is in your circumstance because it's being created by Him right now. And He's investing in His energy in that circumstance now. So He knows all the issues of that circumstance, even when you mess up. He's not less with you when you messed up. But now that you messed up, He took His energy out of you, it will stop to exist if He took His energy out. So even when you messed up, He's there. Completely, fully, with all the empathy in the world. Infinite empathy. It's mind-blowing. And finally, practical difference number three in the way the pre versus post Hasidus model. In the pre Hasidus model, my behavior is irrelevant to anybody but me. Either I'm rewarded or I'm punished. My father likes to say this all the time, that uh, non-religious Jews, whether they articulate this or not, when you ask them to do... Uh, or mitzvah or something like that, what, they, what their response to you is, either they articulate it or not, but this is really what they mean is, I, I don't need to be so religious as you. So my heaven's not going to be as big as yours. It's okay. I don't need the biggest heaven. I have to have the best heaven. It's okay. I don't, I'm a good Jew. What do I need this for? That's what they all say. I'm a good Jew already. I'm a good person. I have to do more. What for? Okay, so you need to be very religious because you want to be the best in the world and you want to have the best heaven. I don't need to be the best in the world. I don't need the best heaven. It's okay. Inevitably, that's what they all say. To which Chassidah says, it's irrelevant whether you're going to be a better heaven or not better heaven. That's not the point. The purpose of all creation is waiting for you. My behavior is not just about how I act. That's the pre-Chassidah model. Hashem is watching me. How much should we reward? How little, much should we punish? And the post-Chassidah model, where Hashem is invested in our realities to create it under the circumstances that are necessary for us to fulfill His purpose for the entire creation. So you're a good person without Torah? True. No one's asking you to become a better person. We're asking you to fulfill your purpose for which you were created. We have time, so one more fourth. That should make you a better person. It will make you a better person anyway. That's right. Because ironically, the best people are the people who aren't being obsessed with being good people. Right? My grandmother says this, 
you know this whole like mode nowadays in the from world where people talk about um, what you're gonna, we're going to do a chesed. Let's go do a chesed. Yeah. You guys, anybody, you guys met my grandmother? Whoever, or whoever asked me to come speak, whoever organized her, she would invite her to speak. She's a lot of fun. You guys know my grandmother? Anybody? The locals don't know who she is. Tookie Tridal. Oh, yeah. Did she speak here? Uh, you should invite her. So she gets very nervous from this chesed thing. She gets very nervous from this chesed business. She's like, I don't understand. I grew up, my, my home was open. We had guests. We were, my, her father gave stucker and all the beautiful things. I never once heard the word, let's do a chesed. Because the point being, ironically, the people who are very obsessed with doing chesed are not always super chesed because they're very busy obsessed with themselves and their chesed and their ganeden and they're becoming better people. And they become just so self-absorbed. It's just, it's a bit much. And the Hasidic model changes all that. Don't become a Chesed person. Don't become a Ganadin person. Fulfill your mission. And if you fulfill your mission, of course you're going to be a nice person. And of course you're going to be a kind person. That's not the point. The point is to fulfill your mission. And that mission is important not just for you. It's important, more importantly, for Hashem and for His purpose. Radical shift in thinking. There was a fourth one that I didn't write down that I wanted to share. What was it? I don't remember Oh, the nowness of Yiddishkeit. The nowness of it. That's the only word I have. The, the, it's no, it's not a word. Uh, <laughs> the immediacy is probably the right word, like, but the nowness of it, the fact that it's now. The Altebber writes in the Gersa Kodesh, it's a shocking statement if you think about it. The Altebber writes that every year on Rosh Hashanah, when you blow Shafer, you bring down an energy from Hashem that has never been brought down by any Shafer before you. Do you know how offensive that is to someone who doesn't learn chassidus? Are you telling me that my farhak to shoifer brings down more energy than the Buddha and Nasi's shoifer? What are you saying? What are you saying? Tzvish Dalder says yes. Yeah, it does. Because whatever he achieved is going to be meaningless unless you achieve what you're achieving. Because now Hashem is creating the world for a purpose now. So we're not keeping a tradition alive. We're not keeping tradition alive. Keeping tradition alive, by definition, means we're getting worse over time. And that's how people don't learn Chassidus think of Yiddishkeit, as slowly getting worse over time. We're farther from Matan Torah, we're farther from the Revelation. And what did the Rebbe say? We're not farther from Matan Torah, we're closer to... We're closer to the Mashiach. What do you mean Father of Matan Torah? Of course you're Father of Matan Torah. Yes, and we don't have the same revelations they used to have. But if Hashem is creating the world now, then there's a purpose now, which couldn't have been a minute ago. Because if a minute ago was purpose, was better than this minute's purpose, then why do we continue to this minute? That would have been what a waste. If we made it to this year, then this year has a purpose that last year does not. There's a nowness to it. There's, a, there's an immediacy to it. It's not a tradition we're keeping alive. I'm going to conclude with this. It's a beautiful vart. It's actually a Polish vart, but it makes this point. No, it's from the Shalom. I'm sorry, not a Polish vart. It predates Chassidus. Shalom writes like this. We, we say every day in our davening. We say in Oz Yashir. You may have heard this vart before. It's a very beautiful vart. Right? Oftentimes, Psukim, when they speak in poetic language, it repeats itself. You heard this vart before? Yeah, you know the vart? Right, but you know the vart? Oh, you'll find that in a second. Yeah, so oftentimes the psukim can repeat themselves, like the lines repeat themselves in kind of poetic fashion. But obviously there's difference in language and the language is precise, so we have to look at that. So, this is my God and I will uh, beautify him. Elakei the God of my fathers, but I'm a and I will exalt him. Yeah, so says the Shalom. Zekeli, if this is my God, Vanveyu, then it's beautiful. Elakei avi, if it's the God of my father, I'm a menu, I exalt him up high. If it's my father's God that I'm keeping alive, it's tradition, then God's somewhere up there at the top of the, to at the, top of the tradition chain watching me and I'm going to keep it going. I'm a menu, I've raised God up to be distant from me. But if it's Zekei Li, this is my God because Hashem is making me now and creating my world now for a purpose that I have to fulfill now, then Van Veyo, then it's a beautiful relationship. And like, the, like he points out, the words Van Veyu are broken up into Anivahu, I and him. Now we're talking one. 
Now I have a relationship with God. And that's really what all of Chassidus is. The Oivachai is nafshenu, the light and the life that Chassidus brings to make it a living, breathing God who is waiting for a living, breathing human called you and is investing in you here, now, because you have a unique purpose to fulfill that nobody else does. L'chaim l'vracha, good job to fuck yar, and thank you all for listening. Any questions or thoughts or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.